Welcome to this week's Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. Uh, greetings from a pretty rainy uh, Washington, D.C. area, which has given me some kind of dramatic mood lighting as I'm here by the window. Maybe we'll have some flashes of lightning just to make things even more entertaining. Uh, we have a fantastic uh, pair of guests today talking about a very, very vital subject, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. In our almost nine years of working in the Future Transform, we've been looking at what in the United States we call liberal education, which is you know, a whole school of thought for how best to teach, especially undergraduate education. But we've also been looking at the politics that question or go against liberal education. We've been looking at that from numerous directions, everything from neo-nationalism to racism and anti-racism to issues around gender and still more. This week, I'm absolutely honored and delighted to host two professors from Europe who have been doing research into what they call illiberal higher education. And we're very interested in what that could be. Before I bring them up on stage, let me just has a note here mentioned this topic is extremely contentious not just in academia not just online but in the world in general and so i as always at the future trends forum try to make sure that everybody here is comfortable and safe if i see any signs of abuse or trolling or anything worse i reserve all rights to delete content or boot somebody out of the session so please be on your best behavior. This is a rich as well as challenging topic, and I'll be keeping an eye on, on everybody here. Well, speaking of everybody, let me begin by welcoming one of our two authors, and this is Professor Joanne Delabal coming to us, I believe, from the south of France. Is, is that right, Joe? Are you really, truly in the south of France now? <laughs> Don't tell anybody. Oh, I just told the world. I'm sorry. It's fine. Don't worry. No, no, that's right. That's where I am. Thanks very much for having us. Oh, it's, it's a delight. I'm really, really glad to see you and host you. Your work is very, very important. Uh, let me let me just ask. We, we have a tradition here on the Future Trends Forum where we ask people to introduce themselves by describing not what they've done, but what they're going to be doing. So what, what lies ahead for you for the next year? What are the topics and projects that are uppermost in mind for you? Mm. Oh, great question. <laughs> Many, I hope. Uh, uh, I'm currently working on a book, trying to finish a book on the work of Hannah Arendt wow. and questions about political paradox in higher education, political crises, and the way in which we imagine the future of higher education as a consequence of that. So you've just, uh, you know, hit on a on the pulse of a question that, you know, is about our session today. So that's one uh, the other is working very much on looking more closely at the ultra-conservative right. Mm -hmm. um, but from a genealogical perspective, I would say, mm. so looking back in time, mm -hmm. looking, mm -hmm. at, looking at the ultra-conservative right as, as a reference in a historical arc-like framework to mm -hmm. the role of empire and the oh, influence right. of conservative ideas and revolutions which have sought to transform the way in which we understand politics globally two huge topics. I, I would love to read both, but especially as I finish my next book, I would love to see your Hannah Arendt and education book. Um, whenever you get a chance, I would love that. Need to finish it first. <laughs> <laughs> I completely understand. Well, welcome. And in, in, in the chat, we have uh, Christopher Nelson approves of this and Vivian Forsman says that uh, she's very interested in this. She uses Arendt's work in a course she teaches about the power of making friends to make mm. change which is very, very interesting. Brilliant. Well, hang on a second, Joe. Let me bring up your colleague um, whoop, here uh, and bring her up on stage as well. And good afternoon or good evening, Professor Peto. Good evening. Thank you for having us. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure indeed. Um, and I've been instructed to call you Andrea because nobody on earth except Hungarians can pronounce your name <laughs> correctly. Um, yeah. So Andrea, this is the limit of internationalization. <laughs> it's one of them. It's one of them. You and Finland, you both have these issues, right? But, um, but let, let, let me ask, what are you working on, Andrea, for the next year? Mm -hmm. What projects, what research, what topics are, are top for you? Uh, thank you very much for this question. So let me first say that uh, uh, I put it in the chat. We met uh, uh, with uh, uh, 
Joe, in this project, the European Union cost action, rising nationalism, shifting geopolitics, and the future of European hi higher education and research openness. Uh, and I think uh, this cost project is uh, a great opportunity to start a permanent infrastructure for those who are the victims of different abuse. And this is uh, one of the aims of this project. And that's why actually I decided to join. And in the coming years, we will be working together for a permanent infrastructure, which mm -hmm. will help uh, academics to fight against um, different abuses, including um, uh, digital harassment. And uh, you know that uh, academic freedom discussion, and I'm sure we will get there, is a very uh, problematic discussion on so many different levels, especially when you talk to people who actually suffered uh, because of harassment or um, attacks or bullying because of their work. So this is one uh, uh, activity I'm very much uh, invested, partly because I'm talking to you from Vienna and I'm a professor at the, at the Central European University uh, which had to move from Budapest to Vienna, and I'm uh, a professor at the Gender Studies Department, which was particularly hit by the illiberal attacks. So this is one of the important political and academic missions for me, to somehow turn my personal experiences into a theoretical article, and that's why we are working together with Joe, and I think that's something which is very useful and also into practice because i mean the number of books uh, written about academic freedom and scholars at risk is skyrocketing it is. on the other hand the practical support and uh, emotional uh, material psychological support is not backing this uh, academic interest so there are a lot of people who are actually making a career on the back of this but uh, you know, the real support is not there. So that's why I hope that this cost action in the future will somehow come up with a kind of monitoring or lobbying or any kind of organization. And I would like to be a part of this. Hmm. Well, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. Um, I, I, well, first, I would love to see that open uh, capital OPEN infrastructure grow. Um, and uh, I, I think you're just doing such vital work. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted. Uh, to see you here. Well, well, thank you for coming. Let me, in fact, let me just rearrange the screen a little bit. Let me make it a, a little, a uh, little more comfortable. Um, and uh, friends, if you're new to the future transform, what's going to happen now is I'm going to ask our guests a couple of introductory questions, and then it's going to be over you for your questions and your comments. So as our guests respond, think about the questions you'd like to put. Uh, think about the reactions you have, the clarifications you want, and so forth. Uh, and we'll have plenty of time for those questions. And again, you can use the chat box, you can use the Q&A box, or you can raise your hand and join us on stage. Now, the, the two of you recently published this extremely powerful, eye-opening piece of how illiberalism is hijacking the university. And friends, if none of you have had a chance to read it, you should see a button on the screen, the bottom left of the screen, uh, kind of tan colored. You can click on that and bring that up. It's not a long article. It's extremely very, very powerful. Um, for everyone who hasn't had a chance to read this yet, can you help us understand what illiberal higher education is in 2024? Uh, either of you can go first. Over to you, Andrea. Oh, see. <laughs> Okay. You go first, I say. <laughs> so that's why we can work so good together, right? <laughs> so um, uh, there is this. Uh, there are several aspects of this article, and I'm so happy that you uh, shared this now, Brian, uh, because uh, there are several uh, aspects of higher education and the transformation of higher education, which is happening under the radar. And this transformation is connected to major new developments, but they, as uh, Joe also mentioned, connected to past uh, issues and uh, the continuities in the uh, uh, European uh, higher education and also global in the, I have to say, global north higher educational mm -hmm. uh, context. So uh, 
the higher education, as you know much better than I do, has been developing from uh, centuries, right? And there has been only recently from the 18th century onwards where this critical thinking and the critical uh, understanding of different issues had been uh, had been coming forward. And after 1945, after the Second World War, there was a kind of uh, uh, consensus that this kind of liberal higher education is the only uh, good way of teaching uh, uh, the, the citizens, especially the Cold War helped because on the other side of the Iron Curtain, there was a totally uh, controlled, ideologically driven higher educational system. And especially after 1990, this neoliberalized liberal higher education system was uh, 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 considering itself the only possible option. And it resulted in several um, major problems, including the um, uh, the faculty becoming uh, uh, you know, ver precarious workers who are mm. servicing the needs of the, uh, the students. But more importantly for our discussion, uh, the uh, whole um, uh, enchantment of higher education had been lost and it was replaced by a kind of managerial output oriented mm. discussion. And this is a problem. This is a problem for the whole uh, uh, higher education. And unfortunately, uh, they were, these are the liberal forces which came up with a solution. And they came up with an alternative to re-enchant higher education and to use that for their own political purpose because higher education matters. So previously, uh, higher education portfolio was given to the not that smart uh, politicians with very limited um, uh, political prospects. By now, higher education became a strategically important uh, field, especially because of this intervention by illiberal forces. And this intervention, this illiberal interventions, uh, consider two directions. One is in countries um, where the liberals are hijacking the state in Hungary, Russia, Serbia. They are uh, using public money in order to uh, build up their own uh, system and they are uh, impoverishing the state education but creating uh, at the same time the second their own alternative institutions and this is what our uh, article was discussing namely that under the radar there is a new higher educational system is being built out now as we speak with uncontrolled seemingly unlimited financial resources and with a very clear political agenda. Mm. So on the one hand, uh, divesting, uh, withdrawing public funds from public universities, and at the same time attracting dark money, um, vast amounts of money to create a, a parallel series of institutions. Would, would that include uh, uh, the uh, uh, Modal University in Vienna, for example? Yes, yes, and this uh, uh, this also shows that I mean th there were there is let's say so after 1990 uh, there were very few uh, uh, liberal universities which were uh, built or founded. Uh, the last wave of uh, founding universities happened uh, after uh, the collapse of communism. The Central European University is one of the products, but several other universities have been founded after 1990 hmm. religious universities. But then there is this no show in the past 40 years. Uh, and uh, this actually raises the question that if this form, university, and the form of university can mm -hmm. actually serve uh, the needs of 2024 and more to come, mm -hmm. uh, that's the topic of this podcast, because this format, this neoliberal uh, kind of um, managerial university structure is basically unable to address, to detect, to map the present challenges not to speak about giving alternatives or solutions. So it's pretty clear that the high, that university as a form of 
uh, uh, knowledge production, knowledge authorization, and knowledge distribution will transform in the future fundamentally. And unfortunately, as we argue in this article, the liberal forces have got very clear vision how this transformation should happen. Mm. I might just follow up there and, and mm. elaborate a bit more. I mean, the reason why I wanted Andrea to go first is because she's got her finger on the pulse of precisely the constellation of forces that are at work, and Hungary being the case in point. And as you said in your description, um, having had a front row seat and seeing how it works. There, there are other, I think, lines of analysis that bring us into the fold so that we begin to see this, you know, I guess we might say new model, if you like, of higher education within the European context. It does exist in the United States and other forms, and there are, you know, some versions of this in the UK, but they look quite different than the Hungarian case, actually, at the moment. But, but the, the range of forces needs to come into play. You know, who's behind this, you know, without us, you know, coming across or being co-opted as conspiracy theorists around it? Who's behind this? Ultra-conservative networks that are globally linked, mm -hmm. um, all basically trans, historically, to quote Duncan Bell, trans historically with certain kinds of dreamscapes of race, dream worlds of race, mm -hmm. nativism, uh, the the, the reemergence of race science, the idea of some kind of original sacred identity and the idea that somehow capturing the university to reinforce its own patriotism, its own sense of itself, at the same time as this moneyed elite, anti-taxers, small staters, you know, all of this um, is, is tied up with the illiberal move. And of course, you know, if you're really thinking about the future, the question is, you know, what made this possible? That's the past, of course. But if you're really thinking about the future, you know, what populist ruptures, mm. you know, provided mm. the opportunity for this to take place? What, you know, what the background that Andrea gave you about the extent to a highly advanced neoliberal um, rationality, Wendy Brown's notion of this pervasive rationality that we, we can't escape you know, providing the space, if you like, for this to happen. So I think, you know, there, there's, you know, you put the pieces of the picture together and you've got a, a powerful story about what we could do in terms of forecasting the future of the university. And I think the other thing that I would, you know, move into is what else is being hijacked, you know, based on the title of your question, what else is being hijacked? Well, of course, the notion of the public sphere I mean, it's been under attack and, and has is been disappearing, you know, for for you know decades essentially, if you like, you know, that's the, the new right capture of modern institutions across the globe. But but this idea that there should be a public is under siege. Oh. And I think this is another version of a liberal that, that's very important. And you know, we might be thinking about, you know, the various actors, you know, we could take the UK, you know, things you know, publications mm -hmm. like uh, the sovereign, in, the, the I think I think it's called the sovereign individual. I'm not entirely sure I've got exactly the title, but this is Jacob Re Reese Moss's mm -hmm. father and colleague writing about the idea that this is the future. The sovereign individual is the future. The concept of the sovereign individual of the future, basically, uh, the conversation I was having with my son about this, this this notion that basically, you know, the ultra conservative elites are in charge, essentially capturing the institutions. And basically saying you can't survive this then you won't survive it and the institutions should teach you that and if they don't if they're striving towards the public this is not a good idea then you know this is you know deeply deeply problematic for anyone who actually has the the larger commitment that actually critical intellectualism and the university is a space for critique uh, the development of robust politically stable societies inclusiveness all these things are, are really part of the picture as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you both. This is a, a, a terrific, terrific detailed answer, uh, which I think gives everybody here a, a great deal to think through. I, I, I'd like to just ask one more question, a kind of primitive detail question, and then I'd, I'd love to hear from um, everybody else. And we've already got some questions coming in, so I, I have to hurry. The, uh, the question I'd like to ask is, what are some of the ways that a given illiberal university would differ from a 
your a traditional uh, liberal university? That is, what are some of the ways the curriculum would differ or its research enterprise? Would the, would the curriculum, for example, no longer include gender studies, no longer include Marxism, no longer include anti-racism? With, with with, you know, say more about that, please. Right. Well, let's 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 start with seeing this on a continuum. Is that all right? Is that right. I, is that okay, Andrea? If I go ahead, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief so that Andrea can have um, some time here too. But let's see it on a continuum. Uh, you know, we we I won't go into history now because I think that will take too long. Those will probably come up in the questions. But if you think about a liberalism as 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 finding its way inside an institution, we might take. For example, the United Kingdom's example of the prevent duty or free speech legislation, which is mm -hmm. essentially basically undermining the academic autonomy of the scholar as a public or critical intellectual and basically turning them into something that we might call a species of monitor. So now the mm -hmm. academic isn't simply free to pursue a scholarly subject on the premise of common world building or research for the world, but rather is actually engaging in a state project where you start to see convergences between their roles in the state. So this is this is one example. So on a continuum, but it's if you're going to the other side, the extreme, the authoritarian, you have centrally appointed rectors. You have what Andrea went through in Hungary, where basically you move the 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 political freedom, the institution housing political freedom and are articulating it and get rid of it, including gender studies, because of course mm -hmm. that would undermine the liberal state school to support heteronormativity, traditional mm -hmm. divine families. Mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, these are all the kinds of things that will happen. So it's, if you see it on that spectrum, you know, you can start to see various ways in which it works. Thank you. If I can just continue, so uh, please, please. and you, I mean, there are several institutions, uh, liberal institutions now, where you, if you look at their web pages, you know, you will see lots of interesting details. So of course mm. they operate in academic years, right? <laughs> they operate with faculty. There are students. There is curriculum. So they look like universities, but they are not universities because mm. actually the critical thinking is missing. Uh, the faculty is mostly appointed by network and there is no uh, that position in the network. So there is not a kind of um, a transparent or quasi transparent process of hiring. It is also the remasculinization of knowledge production because these networks are mostly male networks. So the uh, the achieved uh, privilege of women being equal to men as far as the uh, academic work and intellectual work uh, are concerned is being questioned uh, because women are expected to produce children and uh, uh, do the care work. So they're uh, kind of uh, investing money into their higher education is basically a base because they can do this kind of work with uh, very limited um, uh, knowledge. And also uh, the fields of study. So these uh, uh, illiberal institutions are focusing on social work because they are serving a wider public. They are focusing on uh, human rights, the redefinition of human rights according to the illiberal standards. And also they are focusing on legal studies because we know it also from the US, this is a legal counter revolution which is actually happening which is well planned and um, and coordinated and uh, we also see that in these web pages of those universities there is an emphasis on personal connections on uh, the student faculty ratio so this is not like you know 700 students hurdled into an auditorium where one uh, luck if if they are lucky one person is speaking if they are not lucky then a video is uh, basically um, uh, uh, screened uh, as a form of a lecture so but there is mm. this uh, going back to the uh, universitas when everybody knew everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, this kind of form of teaching is also uh, 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 a new achievement of this uh, illiberal university, which was born on a very legitimate criticism of the neoliberalized liberal universities. 
thank you. Thank you. This is th this is extremely clarifying um, and and very very frightening. Uh, friends, I'm going to stop asking questions of our guests, and I actually put the questions to you all. Uh, what would you like to ask? Uh, what What do you think about this vision of a liberal university, as Joe and Andrea have just outlined, uh, with its pedagogy, with its curriculum? Um, we have two questions that have come in, and, and let me put one on the screen right now. This is uh, from our friend Phil Lingard, uh, not too far from you, uh, in the uh, splendid island country of Malta. Uh, and, uh, and he asked a question about individualism. Uh, how do you foresee these illiberal trends interacting with the increasing individualization of education evolving through AI and educational technology, which he adds is dominated by what he calls illiberal tech bros? Here, I'll, I'll put it on the screen again. I, I don't want to. So how do these illiberal trends that you just articulated, how do they increase? interact with the increasing individualization of education through technology? Hmm. Well, I mean, I, I'll, I'll come in there and, and I'll probably be brief because, you know, I'm not an AI expert or particularly an expert on digital technology and education. But one thing I can tell you is if we were going to go back to the conceptualization of the ways in which modern institutions begin to align with the state, we might actually, you know, I mean, Hannah Rent was excellent on this, but there were other critical scholars of the 20th century that were basically talking about the ways in which scientisms, and I'm not talking mm -hmm. about, I'm not talking about scientific research here. I'm talking about the argument that mm -hmm. somehow states co-opt notions of a certain kind of science in a form of power that they imagine will resolve problems of the future. You know, like, you know, you could think about Elon Musk and his massive quantum computer mm -hmm. or the various um you know ultra conservative rights investing into future oriented scientism using technology as their device and basically somebody like Arendt would have argued that that these are actually technologies of power i'm not saying ai on its own you know does not have a role to play in the future of our societies or even equalizing our the future of our societies but these are essentially in her mind technologies of power that the modern institution of the university consolidates and then drives forward to align with the state but at the same time undermines the potential for other ways of thinking including critique what does that do how does that draw the individual away from from authentic creativity from political promise wow. from natality from you know the birth of the, the concept of the agora having critical uh -huh. thinking arguments that are actually drawing us away from things you know all of the arguments that are come at, coming up around you know what will chat gbt do for example is our uh -huh. current obsession what will it be but i think it's actually symbolically absolutely crucial we capture exactly what it's doing because it's pointing us in a very particular direction and actually one of them is to undermine the very fundamental, I believe, notion of the critical intellectual. I'm not saying the whole of AI is doing that, so I want to park that. I'm just trying to give you a picture of this idea of technologies of power and who's behind them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if I just can make one short comment in relation to the uh, transnational character of this uh, um, uh, digital and digitalization, and that is, of course, challenging not only the nation state, which is usually uh, uh, controlling and regulating uh, its uh, space, but it's also the uh, somehow contributes to the rethinking of internationalization of higher education. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, because if there is a, a shady company which is uh, selling uh, uh, an online degree online uh, uh, internationally, that is actually challenging the uh, accreditation process and the national uh, process of uh, quality control. And uh, that is all in flux. But uh, being a person of glass half full, let me say that this kind of digital spaces can also be spaces of resistance. And uh, let me mention the Off University in Berlin, for example, which mm -hmm. is uh, doing fantastic online uh, digital um, courses for those who are either living in countries where these kind of courses are unavailable 
or they are scholars who migrated and they just want to be a part of an other scholarly community. And uh, I had the privilege of teaching a course there and the uh, securitization of this kind of teaching was mind blowing at the first time when I was uh, entering into this uh, uh, field. And that also shows that, um, you know, what we are talking about is strategically important because the securitization of this field, uh, like higher education and uh, uh, and uh, even sending an email to a colleague in higher education nowadays requires authentication and I don't know what. So, I mean, this is totally changing uh, how the teaching and the role of the in critical intellectual, as Joe was saying, is transforming because uh, uh, you feel like very often as a uh, privileged um, uh, knowledge or no owner who is threatened by different dark forces. And this is not a good feeling. But you know that's the reality therefore you have to have all these different uh, uh, mechanisms and that the off university actually developed all these fantastic digital and online tools to save the data of those who are actually want to study and that's also something which is uh, uh, new because uh, you know you believe that universities are spaces you know brick walls you enter you talk to people and then that's the university but no i mean it is transforming fundamentally wow that's a fantastic comment that's a, uh, thank you for thank you for pointing us to the uh, off university uh, friends I, I i threw in a link to that in the chat um uh, thank you, but Phil, first of all, Phil Lingard, thank you for the excellent question. Uh, and uh, friends, if you're new to the forum, uh, that's an example of that Q&A box question. Uh, so you can please feel free to follow up. Again, the bottom of your screen, white strip running along it, the question mark, type in there. Uh, we have a, another question coming from uh, our good friend Tom Hames, coming to us from uh, Southern Texas. Uh, and he has a question about politics as well, which is appropriate since he's a, a government professor. Uh, and he asks this, how do illiberal governments like mine in Texas or that in Hungary keep liberal ideas from filtering back into their societies? The Cold War and Helsinki Accord should have taught us that that doesn't work. Um, very good question. Very good question. Very good question. But I wish uh, the policymakers and decision makers actually would really learn the lesson of the Cold War. Uh, because if you think about this Helsinki Accord, this was mostly creating a space for people-to-people -people dialogue, right? Mm -hmm. And this was not uh, overburdened by uh, different uh, linguistic and um, uh, kind of uh, ideological language. This was more like... Uh, you know, something which is acceptable for all. But nowadays you feel like that this kind of discussion between um, uh, different actors is like everybody's arriving with a checklist that if the other is accepting this, then we can go further instead of, you know, the discussions um, uh, uh, running into a, a, a you know, it, it would be a really a dialogue figuring out where are the common points. Everybody arrives with a very fixed list of uh, criteria, and they are just checking if the others are meeting with those or accepting those those criteria. And again, let me be the person uh, glass half full. I mean, there are lots of alternative higher educational and educational um, uh, initiatives which are outside of this model of the neoliberal universities. So uh, uh, not only the off university, but for example, in Turkey, there is the Birarada Academy, uh, where there are different universities and educational initiatives, which are already forming a platform. And uh, uh, the, the safety of uh, digital space offered also space for the Afghan women to do a kind of uh, uh, educational activity. So in that sense, um, uh, there are lots of developments in the ground, on the ground, but the donors and the policymakers they do not recognize this because their radar, their tick, like that, that uh, uh, you know, ticking the box exercise doesn't mm -hmm. match the 
the reality in the ground. So that's why the Helsinki, uh, Helsinki Accord was a really good example. So thank you for that, because that was the moment when the donors recognized that dealing with the other part of Europe, they need a different strategy. They need a different language. And this is something which is uh, very much missing nowadays, uh, no matter that there are fantastic um, uh, educational initiatives which remain under the radar, partly because they should, because that's the way how they can operate. But uh, the donors and the politicians, they also unable to recognize this. Mm. Yeah, I might I might follow up there and, and kind of come to maybe come to the I think that's really useful background and come to the question in a targeted way. So we took the case of Texas and Hungary. And I want to also acknowledge somebody who did quite a lot of work on our project, uh, the ESRCH and crisis projects on um, questions around dark money capture. And she introduced me to someone called Isaac Kamala, who's in the States, who's written a really good book on that work. And I'll send you the reference. Uh, Brian, to that because um, I think it's you know was a very important piece for us in terms of comprehending, you know, what this does inside universities or you know what role it might play in, in influencing in universities. And one of them might be to get you know more more politically driven inside the governing side of the institution is the lack of, for example, academic protection, uh, the loss of tenure. You know, all of those things are, are could be behind that, especially if people are actually saying things as we started with, with Andrea's commentary, saying things against the state that, that you know, in fact, are not palatable to that, that particular group or to the conservative right who's got a hold on the institution. But you've got a whole series of other things going on, don't you? You've got, um, you know, versions of this elite capture we're talking about. We've got using the universities as spaces of political lobbying in a particular direction. You've got clientelism, you know, that, that is basically driving this, which is coming back to that academic market, you know, where the institution can't be public, but actually it's about clients. It becomes a space of service, you know, mm. well, but, mm. you know, a capital service. I mean, I mean, service yeah. providers as in not public service. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, you've got a whole number of other other interventions, I think, that are taking place that undermine the capacity for the public. And, that's where the individualism, if you like, in that last question, I think, comes. And I, I think, you know, that the in the article that we did, just to take us back to that, you know, the the the, the things that we were exposing were were about how a think tank structure that has captured a university was able to fund a, a conservative organization inside Brussels uh, and to engage in political lobbying. So of course, there we don't have a university you know, in the way we understand it as a critical intellectual space. We have it as something else, a space of political lobbying. So, you know, we're, we're in this very paradoxical space where, where critical thinking is not part of it. Well, I have to say, Tom Hames has a gift for asking very, very deep and provocative questions. Uh, this is no exception. And Joe and Andrea, those are ex appropriately deep and extensive answers. Um, I, I'm, I, I think a lot of us are, are now trying to think through, Andre, the, the, the checkbox idea and how this responds. In, in, in the chat, there have been some comments about digital samizda, but we have a, another question to just unfold this even further. And, and friends, if you'd like to ask a question, this is a great time. Uh, and I would also, I'd like to hear from, from women in the audience. Uh, we've had a bunch of guys asking questions, which is great, but I'd like to hear from the other half of the human race as well, if you get a chance. And this is a question that I cannot display on the screen, but I can just read out loud. Um, this is from Chris Aldrich, and he asks, are there hints of religion tinged into all of this in Europe, the way the move towards classical education in the U.S. has been going with efforts that are also religious? Uh, Chris points out homeschooling movements in the United States, as well as two uh, institutions, Hillsdale College in Michigan, the new College of Florida. So the key question here is, are there hints of religion tinged into illiberal education in Europe? You say yes, then we move on. But no, I mean, if, if <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, 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 uh, yeah, we, I'll let you go ahead, Andrea, and then I'll follow okay. up. 
Please. Thank you. This is actually important uh, the, the, uh, because there are different religions, right? So different forms of religion and different uh, uh, intentions because this homeschooling, which is coming to, to Europe through Russia, so from US to Russia and then uh, uh, to different uh, um, uh, uh, European countries, uh, this is uh, basically aiming to what Joe was saying, to redefine what public space is. So what ed education is basically about sharing and discussing values and creating citizens and uh, a group of people. But the homeschooling is uh, going against this kind of uh, uh, public space and public good, uh, especially because uh, some of the teachers are doing this teaching without any uh, proper credentials or proper uh, academic uh, authorization. So here I think we should differentiate between the fundamentalist uh, activist religion and the, I would say, mainstream traditional religious schooling, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I don't see any problem that, you know, there is a Catholic university in uh, uh, in. Uh, in a certain country which is focusing on religious uh, education but here we have got uh, a kind of very different aim and a very different uh, agenda for 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 education which is actually destroying the state and uh, going back to the uh, old war of the uh, 12th century between the state mm -hmm. and the uh, religious authorities and this kind of Kulturkampf, which has been uh, the cultural war, which had been, of course, very much present also in the 19th century when the na nation states basically created their own educational system, giving some um, uh, 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 space for religious education. Uh, this is going back. So, I mean, you can say that this is backsliding. I'm not particularly fond of this uh, uh, concept of backsliding, but it, it, is, uh, it is showing that religion is actually uh, also in the forefront of uh, not only destroying the public spaces and the concept of citizen, but also it is hijacked by different political actors. So uh, there is nothing wrong with religious education, but it is wrong when certain shady figures are actually showing up with uh, certain political agendas, instrumentalizing, emptying those um, uh, religious uh, concepts and ideas and institutions for their very shady, very often financially driven agenda. And, and and maybe the follow up to that is um the this sense of which we have to again step back in time so i think andrea's description gives us a a, a, a contemporary picture of what this looks like you know how can this play out you know and, and then ultimately especially if you move on to the concept of the culture war in inverted commas what it does to divide people and then force people you know many in many cases to move to the right as a consequence of these you know, mm. the divisive tropes that get get um, represented in these spheres. But let's go back in time a little bit. And I think this is where it's important for everyone in the audience and for us to make these distinctions, which is the historical origins of universities aren't unproblematic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, let's look at the history of Yale, for example, in the US, oh, or the history yeah. of the institution I work in, you know, the medieval institution, which is essentially representative of empire. Mm, and mm. Much, much of the framework, whilst I think very different from the way moralizing is work, is, was premised on the organization of moralizing norms, certain ideals of the educate, the so-called educated citizen, certain ideals about, you know, the body who could be educated, certain ideals about who represents that. And I think, you know, if you're looking at a triad of things around, again, coming back to this notion of a liberalism, nativism, moralizing norms um you know certain ways of thinking about um who's going to be who has the authorial power uh in thinking about imperialism self the colonial practice look at the history of university of cape town all of these mm, mm, were sites mm. basically in university of cape town of white male bodies 
essentially in charge with a, a, a very important political project. So this is, again, not identical to what's happening in the liberal moment, but we need a radical historiography of universities themselves in order to understand the here and now, the present of this new liberal moment. And of course, the political economy of it, I think, you know, is what, I'm not talking so much about that, but Andrea, I think it's illustrated who these actors become, even if they themselves are unaware of that past. I mean, I wouldn't say, certainly the elite actors in the ultra conservative right movement that are, you know, networked together to change political conduct and the, the role of the university, turn it into a think tank, make it a political lobbying space. They're very aware. They're acutely aware. They're, you know, very well-educated people. You know, we're talking about the Peter Thiels of the world and many others. They're very well-educated. But mm -hmm. but there are many who are involved in these projects that may not know that history. Well, thank you both. That's, uh, uh, Chris, first of all, thank you for that great question. Um, I, I think religion gives a, a great way into uh, thinking this through. Uh, Andre, I really appreciate you disaggregating the many different senses of, of religion here. And and Joe, I, I love the, the the dive into history. People in the chat ran with this already. Uh, Tom uh, mentioned the uh, founding of the Université de Paris in terms of legalizing the destruction of the Templars. I was going to jump in and mention U.S. land grant institutions, but we this is this is terrific. I mean, this the subject of liberal illiberal education is getting deeper and I think more clear. We we have another question that comes in from Tara, uh, and again, this is one I I can't display on screen, but I can I can read out loud. Uh, Tara asks. This speaks well to uh, Butler's book, Who is Afraid of Gender? Can you speak to these intersections here and how we are witnessing the unification of various illiberal anxieties and how this plays out in academia today? I'll just, I'll just read that again because it's a, a really rich question. She's referencing Judith Butler's Who is Afraid of Gender? And she asks, if you can speak to these intersections here, how we are witnessing the unification of various illiberal anxieties and how this plays out in academia today. Okay, so shall I start? Please, um, please. So, please. Uh, uh, so, I mean, I have been working at the Gender Studies Department from 97, and trust me, nobody was afraid of gender then. I mean, gender studies scholars have been working in uh, uh, offices which are located in the attic or in the cellar, and they were really not considered to be important and, uh, and, uh, and you know, uh, worth mentioning. So what made the difference and how this uh, different plays out as far as the university is concerned. So what makes the difference is this kind of uh, polycrisis, what we see mm -hmm. uh, now, and uh, we, that this overlapping uh, uh, crisis is, right, which is uh, the financial crisis from 2008, uh, the so-called migration crisis, uh, the, the pandemic, the different wars. So all this uh, contributed to this anxiety and fear. And then the uh, gender, because of several reasons, is a very good uh, tool for uh, creating a proxy. So when gender is mentioned, usually it is not gender which is considered uh, by or defined by the gender studies scholars, but gender is a proxy. Some colleagues are even saying that gender became an empty signifier, which I'm not sure to uh, surely agree, but with colleagues we were defining gender as a symbolic glue. It glues together the different political um, uh, actors, uh, who have got nothing in common otherwise, but the hate and the exclusion, but actually gender manages to construct. So the Polish football hooligans, the Russian mm -hmm. Orthodox Church, the fundamentalist Jews, uh, the uh, Christian fundamentalists, I mean, they cannot be farther apart, mm -hmm. but gender, what they call gender, as a glue. So it has got nothing to do with what gender studies scholars do, but this is a proxy, this is a glue, which glues them together in order to create an alternative uh, to the neoliberal world order with hate 
exclusion and uh, creating an enemy. What mm -hmm. is the tragedy that this enemy, they are actually real people who are living their real lives. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and uh, this kind of irresponsible, I would say, cynical uh, uh, construction of the enemy is contributed to this uh, debate and uh, the, the fact that if you are coming to Hungary, uh, there are all these huge billboards saying no gender no war right in english which mm -hmm. is a very good tool of the illiberal government to use gender as a symbolic glue to stabilize the political constituency who are voting for them without really explaining what is behind it so this is rather a political uh communication strategy than a real um uh action and of course it has a consequence to higher education because this what they call gender studies is of course nothing to do what gender studies does because gender studies actually became a, a fantastically interesting uh, uh developing field using this political opportunity what the liberal forces gave or offered to gender studies uh, to contribute um, political debates in a meaningful way right uh, uh, the, the, the other the other i suppose the extension of that and i think i'm probably repeating what andrea is saying but it, i think it's important is that we we might think about this within the frame of the way in which the right uh, appropriates identity politics for its own purposes in other words this is absolutely as andrea says strategic and i too was an editor of a journal gender and education for a number of years with a number of uh, feminist colleagues and yeah it, it was a burgeoning field you know we couldn't stop you know the work from coming in again nobody was afraid of it but 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 the reality is here that identity politics in this context becomes a distraction political distraction for them that to to in to enhance their 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 alternative political imaginary so distract it away from the class warfare they're actually trying to energize the race warfares they're trying mm -hmm. to energize mm -hmm. the the ways in which they're trying to consolidate power these become distractions that again split and rupture political constituencies and often in the you know affective registers of anxiety that come with all of this you, you'll see this shift to the right they know exactly you know what they're doing to try and manipulate it so this idea that they could you know for example let's take brazil as a case you know uh represent judith butler in inverted commas as the antichrist mm -hmm. ag against mm -hmm. the notion of traditional knowledge is a distraction for their populist political agendas and I think that's really important is what, you know, what's being appropriated here in the name of this elite capture, an attempt to capture the institution. And again, of course, you, if, if you can't have that conversation in the university, what does it become? So that's where your future, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, your, your notion of the future is important because, you know, you can be absolutely certain that the conservative right is thinking about the future. You know that this is very much a future-oriented political agenda with new geopolitical alliances behind them and i think you know new and old to be fair so i think you know th these are really important things for people to kind of have a sense about well how are we navigating it how do we understand it how do we how do we respond you know that's the crucial that's the crucial point you know what are our problem solving tools in the article that we shared you know we were thinking what you know, we're worrying that the university itself, even the critical one, is not necessarily equipped to deal with the complexity of this, partly because of the bureaucratization of the institution, the privatization, you know, the, the um, uh, essentially acceleration of workload politics and all of these things yeah. that are getting in the way of, of doing good politics inside institutions. Uh, Joe, Andrea, these were terrific, terrific answers. Um, thank you. Uh, Tara, thank you for the superb question. Uh, I really appreciate uh, uh, you, you thinking this through. Uh, again, I think like with religion, uh, gender, or if we put in quotes, gender as in gender ideology, um, is, is another great way into this question of a liberal education. 
I'm afraid I need to wrap things up, though. Uh, we have we have just powered through our hour of conversation at a kind of graduate seminar level of excitement and richness. Uh, Joe, Andrea, I want to thank you so much for being fantastic guests. I can see in, in the window behind you, Andrea, it looks like the sun has set very dramatically. Um, let, let me ask, where where will we be able to find your follow-up research on this? Will you continue to write for University World News so we can look there, or will you be posting some other location? I mean, I have got an academia.edu uh, yes. page and also the research gate. So uh, okay. that's the most are available. And I have a YouTube channel where I put all the interviews and lectures I um, uh, I gave. So you can also find that on YouTube. Oh, fantastic. If, if you get a chance, if you could toss that in the chat, people will definitely grab onto that right away. How, how about you, Joe, in, in between your, your voyages uh, across the world of academia? Yeah, well, I mean, and Andrea and I'll be working together on, on, on various projects related to this cost network. And I just want to shout that out again one more time. Katia Braga, Hannah Moskowitz, who are co-leads on that project. This has really um, inspired a political network of scholars um, that are, are, are striving very much to deal with some of the challenges that we are, are living with. And we're living with them to varying degrees, more or less. I also do a lot of work with a really fantastic colleague in Cambridge, uh, Syrian scholar in exile, Zaina El Ashme. And uh, this is about what's happening to exilic intellectuals, people mm -hmm. surviving this, this populist moment in neoliberal institutions, experiencing a kind of double exile. You know, so they'll talk about double censorship. Mm -hmm. They left their country because of torture and censorship, and now they find themselves in the liberal institutions in Europe and the UK and other places where they're experiencing another level of censorship. And I think the real question about who is the critical intellectual, how does one expand horizons mm. uh, within that context become an important, both political and conceptual question for us. And I think those are those are the points of reference in terms of you know, looking to a, a global solidarity network in terms of responding. And I think you know, that's where these forums and conversations become really significant. So those are the kinds of things I'm thinking about. But I think there's a lot more to come in the ilk or or strain of thinking that we've shared together with you today. Well, thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, thank you for having us. We would We'd love to have your network uh, join us at some point if you like this. Um, and yeah, we'll uh, talk to them. Everyone in the chat, uh, thanks you so much. H have a good evening uh, there in Central Time. Uh, but yeah. friend, uh, don't leave yet. Uh, we have a, uh, just want to point out where we're headed for the next uh, few months in the program. Um, thank you all for the very thoughtful questions. And I'm so glad that you were able to uh, make time to, to work for this. If you'd like to continue discussing the question of illiberal education, dark money, uh, the questions of what we reveal when we look at this through lenses of gender or religion and so on, please, uh, you can feel free to take to social media. Use the hashtag FTTE if you can. And here you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, Mastodon, Threads, and Blue Sky, and as well, of course, my blog. Uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions, which have touched on this from other ways, including uh, academic freedom, just go to our archive at tinyurl.com slash FTFarchive. Uh, if you'd like to look into our upcoming sessions, uh, which touch on other topics from enrollment to reforming grading to preparing for a Trump administration in the U.S. to the future workforce, just go to the Future Trends Forum website at forum.futureofeducation.us. Thank you all again for being great discussion partners and thinking partners. I hope you all are safe and sound, and we'll see you next time online. Take care. Bye-bye.